There are a few things in life where if somebody tells you those things, you know 100% that they are a grifter. They are a con man. They are trying to con you into something. The most obvious sign of a con artist is somebody who's telling you that a well-known, well-worn truth, something that is absolutely irrefutable, is not true. They know better. They know better because they've seen through the matrix. They've seen through that truth. That truth is actually a mask for the underlying reality. Now, it may be that there are some widely held notions that are untrue, but in order to debunk those notions, you would actually have to show why your notions are better. However, if you are the kind of person who suggests, for example, that hard work is useless, I have a better way, a better way, that better way is going to earn you fast money without a lot of work, without getting yourself educated, without putting in the hours, without developing a skill set, that person is conning you. They are lying to you. If somebody were to tell you, for example, that there is an easy, easy way for you to get absolutely fit with no exercise and eating trash, that person would be lying to you. That person would be conning you because obviously you need to eat healthy and do exercise if you want to be in shape. And the biggest one of all, and has been held true by pretty much every griftery movement of the last couple of centuries, is the idea that you should not get married, that marriage is bad for you, that somehow marriage is going to ruin your life. Now, there are a lot of problems with the current legal structure of marriage. I agree with that critique of the current legal structure of marriage. No fault divorce is one of the worst things that ever happened to Western civilization. Marriage is a commitment. That commitment is lifelong. There should actually have to be a really, really, really good reason why you are divorcing. And that's particularly true if you have children, because, of course, marriage is designed as the fundamental building block of institutional society. It is the place where children are reared. It is the place where you produce children in the first place. And children require stability. It is from those fundamental building blocks of civilization, the little platoons, as Edmund Burke called them, that you can actually build a functional free civilization, which is why every griftery movement of the last couple of centuries has assaulted the family from the outside. So, for example, Karl Marx, very big on assaulting the family. The Communist Manifesto famously suggests abolition of the family. Why? Because the family is a place where you might learn bourgeois values. It's a place where you might be inculcated into things like responsibility, duty, church. These are all very bad things, according to the Marxist movement, which is why the Communist Manifesto says, on what foundation is the present family, the bourgeois family based? On capital, on private gain. In its completely developed form, this family exists only among the bourgeois. But this state of things finds its complement in the practical absence of the family among the proletarians and in public prostitution. And so blowing up the family would allow for a better world. Don't get married. Fight the fight. Blow up the traditional institutions that actually support a functional society and fight the fight. This is also why today the New York Times has an entire article titled Lessons from the 20 Person Polycule, because the New York Times also wishes to destroy the fundamental basis of Western civilization, namely the family. And they wish to do this because they wish to build something new atop the ruins. They wish to create a society of atomized individuals who then can be molded and shaped according to the whims of the New York Times, because once you're isolated from other human beings, once you have no duty to your family, once you have no duty to kids, once you have no duty to the community that is built upon those families, well, then we can militarize you in any possible direction, which is why you've seen so many left-wing outlets lately pushing for polyamory in the same way that the Communist Manifesto once pushed for polyamory and the holding of all sex sexes in common. So, for example, today, the New York Times says, quote, the word polycule is a synthesis of polyamory, engaging multiple romantic relationships and molecule. It's not clear when the word was coined, but it seems to have started catching on around 15 years ago to suggest an intricate structure formed of people with overlapping deep attachments, romantic, sexual, sensual, platonic. It's difficult to describe a polycule. Words like family and network are used, but neither on its own captures it. Perhaps it's best left to a polycule to offer descriptions. These are the voices and images of people who are part of a polycule in the Boston area. Katie says the word, the polycule is like this weird family. Anne says, it's a chosen family. It works like complex kinship networks work, only a little kinkier. It reflects radical queer values. Well, I mean, of course it does. Of course it does. Because the basic idea of the left is that every single person is basically a malleable widget violating the strictures of the evil society, right? This is part of the big con. The big con is the idea that there are things like gender roles and these gender roles are rooted in biology. But if you can see through that immutable truth, then you will have destroyed the matrix. This is the perspective of the left and this is why they fight the family. This is also why children have basically become to this group of people a tote bag. It's something that you occasionally have in order to manipulate in a particular form or fashion. But this is not restricted to the left. The attack on the family is not, unfortunately, restricted 
to the political left. All grifters, all con men have to take immutable truths and they have to tr attempt to subvert those immutable truths in favor of something only they have uncovered. Something incredible that you never knew about. And if only you take that red pill, then you'll know it. You'll know it. And then you'll be rich. You won't have to do hard work in order to be rich. You won't have to be a good person in order to attract a good mate. You won't have to spend the time raising your children in order to be a successful man. They've discovered the secret. The leader on this side of the movement is, of course, Andrew Tate. We'll get to more on this in a moment. First, the cost of living has already increased 17% this year and continues to rise despite interest rate controls. Now more than ever, you need to be confident in the financial services companies you work with. And Birch Gold is the proven industry leader you want on your side. They show you how precious metals investments can fortify your lifestyle and your retirement, even in turbulent economic times. Birch Gold understands that navigating financial decisions can be intimidating. If you're considering converting an existing retirement account into a precious metals IRA, their dedicated in-house IRA department is there to guide you. Birch Gold values your questions and concerns. Their team is always available to provide answers and clarity. Whether it's about fees, taxes on rollovers, or the timing of the process, they're here to ensure you feel heard and informed. Text Ben to 989898 to talk to one of Birch Gold's experts and claim your free info kit on gold. You'll learn how to convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold. The best part is it's not going to cost you a penny out of pocket. Just text Ben to 989898. Again, text Ben to 989898 to get started with my friends over at Birch Gold. Get all the information, then think about investing just a little bit of money in precious metals. Text Ben to 989898 to get started. Andrew Tate, who got his start as a provocative reality TV star, who then started a webcam business grooming women into sex trafficking, effectively. And that is according to his own admission. That's how he made his money. Whether he says that they were groomed or not groomed, the reality is he groomed women into getting into the webcam industry, which is pornography. Well, Andrew Tate has this, this is his game. His game, Andrew Tate, he's become incredibly popular online for a reason, which we'll examine in a moment. Number one, Andrew Tate is very entertaining. He's entertaining because he explodes the myths. But the way that he, quote unquote, explodes the myths is he plays a really stupid game. It's a game for stupid people. The game is like this. I'm going to say two transgressive things, things that violate the taboos of the culture around me. One of those things is true, and one of those things is false. But because they are both transgressive and because people will oppose me on both of them, one for bad reasons and one for good reasons, this means that I have somehow gotten under the skin of the matrix. Everyone opposes me, which is why I'm a rebel. That's Andrew Tate's entire game. So he will say things like, feminism has ruined men by usurping the male role and robbing men of their initiative. That is a true thing. That is a true thing that is not politically correct to say. Then he will say another transgressive thing that is absolutely false. Like, for example, women love it when you treat them like garbage and you should treat women like garbage. And dominant men are the kind of men who treat women like garbage. That is not a true thing. It's a transgressive thing. And it's transgressive specifically because it's evil. It is a bad thing to say. It is a bad thing to think. Women should not be treated like trash. And good women do not want to be treated like trash. And you treating women like trash is not going to make your life better. And it's not going to make their life better. But it is a transgressive thing to say. It is taboo. And so Andrew Tate has violated so many taboos. And he can get away with it because, of course, the rules don't apply to him. He's a Nietzschean Ubermensch because he is very, very buff and because he works out a lot and because he smokes cigars. And this means you should listen to him. You should listen to him, in fact, so much that you should pay him $49.99 a month to join Hustlers University, where you will learn other secrets. Like, for example, you don't need hard work and initiative in order to really get ahead. You can learn his magical methods for making lots and lots of money. You can own a Bugatti, just like Andrew Tate owns a Bugatti. And all you have to do is listen to his magical business advice, which explodes all of the matrix explodes the matrices of truth, the immutable truths. Now, why am I talking about Andrew Tate today? The reason I'm talking about Andrew Tate today is because Andrew Tate, again, playing the two transgressive things, one true, one false game, has over the past few months said some true things and then said a lot of false things, all of them transgressive, right? So the true thing that he has said is he said, quote, I pray Christianity regains its strength and protects its societies against the pervasive and constant erosion of morality by the devotees of Satan. If you accept everything, you stand for nothing. I agree with literally every word of that Andrew Tate statement, that Christianity ought to regain its strength and protect its society against the pervasive and constant erosion of morality by the devotees of Satan. I agree with all of those things, actually. Then Andrew Tate will put out tweets like the one that he did yesterday. Here is Andrew Tate's tweet, and this is why it comes up in the context of marriage. Again, he is telling you an immutable truth must be exploded. That immutable truth is the fundamental good and necessity of family. Quote, Dear white men, you're effed. 
you're being replaced because none of you have children. Okay, so again, even within this tweet, he is saying a couple of things, one tra- all transgressive, some true, some false. One, Western societies are not reproducing a replacement rate. That's a very bad thing. We've talked about that on the show a lot. It is why, for example, family is necessary. But he goes further because, of course, this is his game to say many transgressive things, some true, some false. Quote, dear white men, you're effed. You're being replaced because none of you have children. Even those of you about the replacement online, like little girls, don't find the gumption to F. I see white men bragging about having five kids as if it's an achievement. LOL. Five? LOL. Per year, right? Oh, all you white boys lost control of your women. He's a genius. Y-O-U apostrophe R-E. All you white boys lost control of your women, and now they won't accept multiple wives anymore. Now they tell you they don't want any more kids. One's enough. Okay, again, just move the apostrophe. In any case, put aside the grammatical picayune concerns. They don't want to do their God-given job anymore. No, they want Instagram likes instead. So your genetic potential is stumped by the whims of some singular female, a female who takes nine whole months to grow a single baby. Other races have multiple ovens for bread. We're not cucked. Some bitch is screaming at you about loyalty and you're sitting there saying, yes, baby, off to porn when she's asleep or maybe cheating with a side condom on. Oh no, I couldn't get another woman pregnant. My wife would kill me. Total effing losers. Soon your race will be nothing more than a few pages in a history book. A lesson on what happens when you F the female psyche so hard they're obsessed with money and social media as opposed to being one of many baby factories for a king. 30 children minimum for the dons. White people, go talk to your best friend wife about what to do this weekend. Maybe you can take a nice walk around the Ikea. Enjoy extinction. Okay, so again, one true thing, many false things. One true thing, people need to be having more kids in Western civilization. The many false things, marriage is bad, loyalty to your spouse is bad. Society can be built on men running around having sex with 30 women and having 30 kids per year. And this is the true measure of a man. And young men, think of that like, wow, that sounds amazing. Because of course, the male sex drive looks for various women. That is just the way that mammalian biology is built. Men, males seek to impregnate many females. And so that sounds great to a bunch of young men who are d***ing off to Andrew Tate's webcam business. It sounds amazing to them. That's also not how societies are built. But again, the idea is, and this is how you know it's a con, marriage is bad. Right? He's actively saying that marriage is bad. Because if you're a person who has five kids, LOL. Now, Andrew Tate himself claims that he has double-digit kids. We've never met any of those kids. We don't know exactly who the moms are. They, maybe it's like a girlfriend in Canada. We don't actually know. But for those of us who do have, say, four kids, I have four kids. I've been married for 15 years. If you have four kids, double the replacement rate, you are, in fact, doing your societal job. And you should be doing that. But that can only exist functional children, children who are going to propagate good values, require a father in the home. See, here's the thing. If you knock a bunch of ladies and you leave, you have created a generation of young men who are incapable of raising themselves. The effects of single motherhood in the United States are very well known. You're talking about higher levels of drug use, higher levels of crime, higher levels of poverty, higher levels of suicidal ideation. It creates actual pathologies. And that is what Andrew Tate is promoting because he is a con artist and he is conning you into doing something. He is conning you into giving away the only pathway toward actual societal success and personal success in favor of his vision of a Genghis Khan-like spreading of his seed. We'll get to more on this in just a moment. First, 20 bucks barely gets you anything these days. You can't even fill your gas tank for less than 20 bucks. But you know what $20 will get you? From the cell phone company I use, Pure Talk, you can get unlimited talk, text, and plenty of 5G data for just $20 a month. Pure Talk gives you the same quality of service as your current cell phone provider, but for half the cost. The average family saves almost $1,000 a year, all with no contracts and no activation fees. You can switch to Pure Talk and keep the phone and phone number you currently use, or you can take advantage of their great deals on the latest iPhones and Androids. Making the switch is incredibly easy. Their U.S. customer service team can help you join Pure Talk in as little as 10 minutes. Choose to spend your hard-earned money with a wireless company that shares your values, supports our military and veterans, creates American jobs, and, you know, doesn't advertise on the fake news networks. Stop spending a ridiculous amount of money on your phone plan. Go to puretalk.com slash Shapiro. Right now, my listeners get an additional 50% off your very first month of coverage. I've been using Pure Talk myself for years. They have a great tower network, which means their coverage is excellent. Plus, it's cheaper. Go to puretalk.com slash Shapiro and get an additional 50% off your very first month of coverage. The reason this is important is because a lot of young men are falling into this sort of stuff. There are a lot of people, obviously, he has, he's very popular. So Andrew Tate got a lot of blowback for this. And then he plays the dumb game that is played on X all the time. The dumb game goes something like this. Again, this is the, it's such a gaslighting game. 
He's going to say two things, both transgressive. One true, one false. Then when you attack the false thing, he is going to claim that you are attacking the true thing. So you say, yes, Western people need to have more babies, but that can exist only within the context of a religious family structure, which traditionally is how it's done. And so my critique is that you are trash propagating that men should go screw around with 25 women, impregnate them, leave the babies to be left alone with no father, and then declare yourself a real man, oiled up and muscled. It's pathetic, actually. It's degraded and pathetic. Yes, Andrew Tate is a kickboxer. Yes, Andrew Tate could kick my ass physically. Yes, Andrew Tate is not a real man if this is the kind of garbage that he propagates. End of story. But the game here is that if you then attack the obviously cloddish and foolish part of what he is saying, then Andrew Tate says that you're attacking the true part of what he's saying. So here's a video that he released shortly in the aftermath of the blowback he received for this. What's the chance of the white people kicking out all the people who aren't white from their countries? Slim to none. Zero. Zero. How many kids do you got? How many kids do all white people have? Zero. It's a path to extinction. (laughs) Why are they mad at me for pointing that out? And then they're tough guys on Twitter because what they're really butthurt is because I said, you don't control your women anymore. And they know it's true because their women go, I don't want a baby. I want Instagram likes. So they're really butthurt by that. So they're sitting there going, no, actually, I'm going to deport everyone. You're a (laughs) (laughs) We're not going to deport You're not going to deport anyone. You brave, big, talking people of England. You're going to deport the prime minister. You're going to deport the first minister of Scotland. They they rule you. (laughs) So again, what he is doing is he's misdirecting to a dumb critique of what he is saying, which is, well, we can always deport all the... First of all, I'm not sure why you would deport people on the basis of race rather than ideology. I've gotten a lot of flack in particular circles for suggesting that race is not destiny, mainly because race is not destiny. That is the fundamental building block of any functional civilization is that ideas are destiny. Race is not destiny. In any case, what Andrew Tate is doing there is he's attacking a dumb critique of what he is doing in order to avoid the culpability for saying something that is actually immoral and evil. Again, this is a person who literally says, on the one hand, that he prays that Christianity regains its strength and protects its societies against Satan. On the other hand, he openly talks about having made millions of dollars scamming people through a webcam business. And now he scams people through Hustlers University. And also you shouldn't get married and you should impregnate as many women as possible. Sounds super Christian. Slow clap for all the people who believe this garbage. Seriously. Okay. So this means that we have to now explain Andrew Tate's grift. He's gotten away with this for a very long time. And I'm sure he'll continue to get away with this with a certain segment of the population who really, really likes WWE kayfabe garbage. They really, really like that Andrew Tate walks around his Romanian warehouse without a shirt. And that's that's like, wow, what a man. Okay, it, it, listen, if that's what floats your boat, enjoy spending 50 bucks a month on Hustlers University to learn how to MLM for his social media presence. Fine, but don't pretend that this guy is standing for anything remotely like a functional society, virtue, or decency. He is standing for your money in his pocket so he can buy more luxury vehicles before his latest arrest. That is what he is actually standing for. Okay, so let's go through Andrew Tate's history a little bit here because when he is talking to somebody of right-wing bent, he pretends to be sort of a traditionalist on matters of family and sex. And then immediately he'll turn around and he'll tweet something like this. And then we're all supposed to ignore it if you're on the right or say that he's being ironical or something like that. But the reality is this dude has made a lot of money over a lot of time by scamming people. So he started by making a lot of money off the sex industry. There's a person who says that he now stands for virtue and for the manly virtues. Can I tell you something that's not manly? Grooming women to get naked on camera for you to make money off of. The ideal of masculinity is not being a pimp. Andrew Tate was a pimp. Not 10 years ago, very, very recently. As recently as three years ago, he was pimping women out on webcam while simultaneously declaring that young men are wasting their time and their virility on pornography. Agree, which is why I don't run a webcam business where I pimp out women who I get into the business by having sex with, which was Andrew Tate's entire method. Here he was explicating his method in 2020. So yeah, on corporatetape.com, I have my PhD program and that is a PhD is a pimp and hose degree that I'm um, clever. And that, clever. That, that, that teaches basically how I got girls. What a class act. How I met girls, how I got girls to like me, how I got girls to fall in love with me to work on webcam for me. Because that's what I did. That was my, my MO was find girls, make them love me and make them work for me. And that's how I got rich. I was all about trying to get paid. Like my whole, I used sex as a tool to make women love me so they'd obey me and live in my house and make me money. That, that's what I wanted. So I was a 
pimp in that sense. Like I was not trying to have sex with women. I was trying to get women to obey me. And I realized that's easier if they like to have sex with me. <laughs> if they don't like having sex with me, it's pretty hard to make them listen to me. There's the shtick. And so for a lot of young men who fantasize about having sex with good looking women, this sounds amazing. Also, it makes you a complete piece of human debris. It makes you garbage if you act like this with regard to women. No matter how much sex you're having with randos off the Instagrams. We'll get to more on this in just one second. First, there is nothing like sitting in the orchestra section at a concert because, you know, it's great. But you need to actually register early for those tickets because if you don't, somebody else will grab the tickets instead. Well, the same thing holds true if you're hiring for your business. You want to find the most talented people for your open roles before the competition scoops them up. And the best way to do that is with Zip Recruiter. Zip Recruiter helps you find qualified candidates fast. Right now, you can try it for free at ziprecruiter.com slash daily wire. Immediately after you post your job, Zip Recruiter's smart technology shows you qualified people for that role. Amp up your hiring performance with ZipRecruiter and find the best talent fast. See why four to five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within day one. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Try it for free. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. We've been using ZipRecruiter ourselves at the Daily Wire for years. We are constantly making our employee base better. And by the way, threatening our old employees with ZipRecruiter because you never know who's going to get ZipRecruiter. Head on over to ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire right now and get the best employees possible. ZipRecruiter is indeed the smartest way to hire. ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. And now, of course, he has moved beyond this because he got arrested for a bunch of stuff related to his webcam business. And he runs Hustlers University, which is where you learn. So before you learn from him in, in his pimping hose degree. You learned how to make lots of money without actually doing any work by having sex with women and then convincing them to take off their clothes for the prurient interests of other men on the internet. Well, now he's moved on to bigger and better things. Hustlers University, where he promises he's going to teach you how to make tons of money. All you have to do is pay him $50 a month. And he's going to teach you how, you know, just like marriage is a scam and he's going to help you see through it by taking the red pill. He, it turns out that all of industry can be cracked by going on Hustlers University where he will teach you all the money-making secrets. Now, the reality is that there is no actual, quote-unquote, secret to making money. If you want to make a lot of money in this life, you have to do three things, okay? That's it. You want to make a lot of money in this life. Find the thing that you like to do, the thing that people are willing to pay you for, and the thing that you are good at. If you find those three things, you will end up making a lot of money. If you find two of those three things, you might be happy without making a lot of money, or you might be unhappy without making a lot of money. But that's it. Okay, you have to find something you like to do, something you're good at, meaning you have to develop an actual skill set, which requires time and attention and investment and, and real focus on detail. And you have to find something people want from you. So it can't just be making mud pies in the backyard. It has to be something that appeals to other human beings who want to pay you for that thing, which can be difficult too. You have to find a market, right? There is no dirty secret to making a lot of money quick. Okay, this is Andrew Tate's equivalent of, hey guys, have you ever heard about the day trading? So CoffeeZilla, who is an excellent YouTube account, he does a good job debunking all of these sort of online scams. He did a full-scale investigation into Hustlers University. Here's a little bit of what he found. And part of it, by the way, is that one of the ways that Andrew Tate goes viral on social media so often is because part of his get-rich-quick scheme for people is that they have incentive structures so that you tweet out videos or send out videos on social media about how wonderful Andrew Tate is. The program he runs is called Hustleversity, where he teaches you how to make fast money if you'll only pay $50 a month. And one of these fast money methods turns out to be selling Hustleversity to new people by posting clips of him, Andrew Tate. And because of this, it kind of created this pyramid scheme where there was a flood of TikTok videos and biased reviews saying that Andrew Tate is the one true savior that will save you from poverty. He's basically Morpheus from the Matrix. and. That's not even me calling him that. He calls himself that. I get called Morpheus a lot. We are living inside of the Matrix, and I am Morpheus. He says he wants to wake you from your mental prisons, all by selling you a program that sounds like what high school dropouts used to put as their education status on Facebook. Attended the School of Hard Knocks and graduated Hustleversity with a PhD. Wait, you're a doctor? No, that's the pimping hose degree, which is something, by the way, I didn't make up. It's a course that Andrew Tate himself sells, but I don't think you want to take advice from someone who's in the middle of a human investigation. I joined this month and have been going through the classes, which is basically all of the same boring topics all of these guys teach about making money. It's all the most surface level stuff. He assigns a so-called professor to each skill 
And all of this all takes place inside of Discord servers. And so in these chat rooms where your instructors have a fraction of the charisma of Tate, you're supposed to commit yourself to these skill sets, which are super surface level, because of course, this all appeals to the lowest common denominator men who think answers can come from TikTok videos. And this is where it starts to hit you as you're scrolling through Discord threads that this kind of was all a big bait and switch. I mean, think about it. You've been told you're gonna escape the matrix. You're gonna take the red pill. But what you end up doing in this course is sort of learning how to run an Amazon side hustle for Jeff Bezos. So that's the game. The only person who makes real money off of this is Andrew Tate. So just how rich is Andrew Tate? Because again, his entire shtick is based on the idea that he is in his own personage, uber male. He is the ideal male. He's having sex with beautiful women. He's got Bugatti. He's got luxury cars. And that's why you should ignore marriage. That's why you shouldn't get married. That's why you should sign up for Hustlers University and pay him money is because he is the ideal. Again, it's always a grift. When someone tells you that a time-tested truth is false and they know the real secret and they have no evidence of this, that's a grift. This is a grift. And people have fallen for the grift by the tens of thousands. I don't say by the millions because it's not true. Okay, now let's talk about Andrew Tate's actual level of wealth. Did you know a baby's heart begins to beat at just three weeks? At five weeks, the heartbeat can be heard on ultrasound. This can sometimes be a baby's only defense in the womb because when moms who are considering abortion hear that baby's heartbeat via ultrasound, they're twice as likely to choose life. Preborn rescues 200 babies every day from abortion by simply providing moms with ultrasounds. By six weeks, a baby's eyes are forming. By 10 weeks, a baby's elbows and knees are able to bend. Preborn needs your help to save these precious lives. Preborn is out there on the front lines. They're helping women choose life. Please consider sponsoring one ultrasound for just 28 bucks and save a life today. Or if you have the means, consider a leadership gift of $5,000. That tax-deductible gift will sponsor Preborn's entire network for 24 hours and help rescue 200 innocent lives. Go to preborn.com slash Ben to donate today. It's the most important thing you're going to do today, maybe ever, because saving lives doesn't get more important than that. Go to preborn.com slash Ben. These ultrasounds are, in fact, life-saving. Moms meet their babies long before they're born. When they meet their baby, it makes it a lot harder for them to get an abortion. Go to preborn.com slash Ben or dial pound 250 and say keyword baby. That's pound 250 baby. So just a few months ago, Andrew Tate tweeted out, this is September 2023, with, of course, the obligatory picture of himself working out shirtless. Quote, for five months, they locked me in my house. During that time, I developed a simple routine. Wake up, garden, laptop, and wait. Make a minimum of $300,000 and do a minimum of 10,000 reps, a new ice cold water every 20 minutes, a new coffee every 1.5 hours. Eh, that's a lot of time spent peeing, I would imagine. Eight hour shifts, usually 11 till seven. Chefs have dinner on the table at eight. I eat my only meal of the day with the soldiers in my house because he leads, of course, a true army in Romania from a warehouse. Then discuss and smoke cigars, shisha, deep into the night. And then he talks about how you know, he used to take time off and go to dinner and go shopping, but he, he, he felt bad because he wasn't doing enough reps and he was only making $280,000 a day instead of $300,000 a day. So if he actually were making $300,000 a day, that calculates out to about $110 million a year. That's a lot of money. That's like a lot, a lot of money. So um, how much money is Andrew Tate actually worth? We should ask these questions because after all, it is based on his his projection of wealth that so many people are falling for the lie that you can just dispense with time-tested wisdom, like get married and have children and live a solid life in favor of absolute stupid waste of money like Hustlers University. So um, remember that time that Tucker Carlson went and interviewed Andrew Tate and they marveled at his magical mansion in Romania? And this unbelievable mansion in Romania? Wow, huge complex in Romania. Okay, so I'm just going to point out that that amazing mansion in Romania it has a parking lot and it's got some cars in it. Ooh, 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 ooh. That mansion in Romania is not in the nice part of Romania. It's actually in kind of a garbage part of town. It's actually an industrial warehouse he bought for $700,000 and made over, according to the New York Post. They asked Andrew Tate for comment, no comment. How about his other wealth? The UK Guardian did a look into this. They said Tate says he owns a chain of 15 casinos and that they earn him a million dollars a month. Apparently not, according to the company records in Bucharest. We search high and low and find no evidence. He owns a single casino. It's tough to find out how much Tate's Romanian companies are actually worth. We can find tax returns for only one. Talisman Enterprises, listed as a web portal business. That has 1.2 million pounds of debt. Oh, the Guardian asked him for comment, by the way. No comment. 
Also, you'll recall a video of Andrew Tate giving a tour of his fantastic castle, supposedly worth hundreds of millions of dollars, this unbelievable castle. Here's a little bit of this incredible video of his castle. Uh, he's walking through uh, the, the doorways of the castle. And this, of course, means that all of his advice about life, such as treat women like absolute trash, that that's, um, that's the way you should do it. Because obviously he owns a castle and only a very rich man, a very successful masculine kind of man, owns a castle. Um, there's only one problem. He doesn't own the castle. According to the tab, Andrew Tate's castle is an Italian hotel in Umbria, two hours away from Florence. Hotel Castello di Reccio is a boutique luxury hotel owned and operated by Count Benedict Bolsha and his wife, Donna Nencia. They lived in the dilapidated castle and raised their five children before architect Benedict redesigned the building into a hotel in 2021. You can see pictures of the hotel. His parents continue to live on the estate. There's no evidence Tate owns any part of the Italian family's estate. How much does it actually cost? Well, if you decide that you want to stay there for a night, then you are going to spend about 950 bucks a night. So for just $950, you too can pretend to own a giant castle in Romania and then sucker a bunch of dispossessed young men into believing that you hold the secret to wealth creation. So how much is he actually worth? According to the Daily Mail, June 2023, when Romanian authorities arrested him, they actually did a rundown on his wealth and here's what they found. Quote, despite the influencer previously claiming to be a trillionaire, a press release from Romania's anti-organized crime prosecution unit Dicot suggested Tate's true fortune was more likely around 10 million pounds, which is about 12 and a half million dollars in today's dollars. As part of the indictment, prosecutors ordered the confiscation of luxury assets from the Tate brothers, including 15 high value cars, 14 luxury watches and about 440,000 pounds held in cryptocurrency, according to the agency's statement. So Andrew Tate has some money. Is he beyond the world wealthy such that you should explode thousands of years of human knowledge about things like marriage? and how to properly treat women, and how to build a civilization? I think not, because the grift is the grift is the grift. So just to sum up, when it comes to Andrew Tate, Andrew Tate's idea of true manhood, the thing that you should emulate by getting rid of fundamental human institutions like marriage so as to impregnate as many women as possible in preservation of the white race, which is what he literally tweeted yesterday. Here is his idea of manhood. Convincing men away from the only human institutions that have ever driven happiness, having sex with a wide variety of women, impregnating them and then abandoning your children, exploiting women for money by having them pose naked on camera and then making money off of them, which makes you a pimp, lying about your wealth, buying luxury vehicles and making over cheap Romanian real estate so that you appear significantly wealthier than you are. So people will, will think that you actually are a deeply successful human being who has started a real business rather than, you know, a scam. And of course, just to top it off, talking about how you can beat people up physically and walk around shirtless and smoke a cigar, which is a... Uh, Good for you, dude. Good for you. Turns out there are a bunch of dudes in jail who can do the same exact thing. So, Andrew Tate, why does this all this matter? Because the onlines have warped people's brains. They've warped people's brains. On the left, you have the, you have the New York Times, fully legacy media publications pushing the idea that marriage is over. Family is over. You need a polycule. What you need is the Communist Manifesto brought to life. You need gender queer polycules in order to really fix society's problems. And on the right, you have grifters who are willing to take advantage of the collapse of traditional religion in order to fill in that gap with scams where they maximize their own earning potential and their own exposure. And all it takes is a few well-placed paid operatives on the social media platforms in order to maximize your exposure. And then people will believe you're much more successful than you are. In reality, there is no easy path to success. There is no easy path to societal building. There is no easy path. But there are paths that work. And those paths include things like get married and have kids with a good woman if you're a man or with a good man if you're a woman. They include things like go to church. Like don't just proclaim that you love a particular religion on the interwebs and then never go to church. Go to actual church and involve yourself in actual community building. Do that. Get a skill set. Cultivate that skill set. Spend long hours doing things for free to cultivate that skill set. Get good at it and then market it to people who want to trade their good products and services to you for your goods, products, and services. These are the pathways to success. There's nothing easy about it. 
It's also the only path to actual life success and fulfillment and happiness. And anyone who promises you the cheat code is lying to you. All right, in just one second, we'll get to the latest brouhaha over at NPR first. Behold, the iconic Leftist Tears Tumblr is back. You see, everyone has wanted this for a long time. There's only one way you can claim yours, by becoming a new Daily Wire Plus annual member. Not only does your annual membership bestow upon you unparalleled access to ad-free, uncensored shows from your beloved Daily Wire hosts like me, you also have unlimited access to our entire library of on-demand hit movies, documentaries, and groundbreaking series, like my brand new series, The Divided States of Biden. We went down to the border to check out the border crisis. We went over to Kensington, which is an area of Philadelphia, to check out fentanyl. There's more coming. Let soccer moms boast about their Stanleys and techies gloat over their Bluetooth-enabled smart mugs. You'll be taking a stand as you sip from this, the iconic leftist tears tumbler. Get a new Daily Wire Plus Insider Annual Membership, receive one free tumbler, or you can put your money where your values really are, get an all-access membership, and receive Two Leftist Tears tumblers absolutely free. Join right now as we fight the left and build the future at dailywireplus.com. Okay, meanwhile, as it turns out, the thing that you can't say at NPR is that NPR is biased to the left. You're not supposed to say this, even though it's perfectly obvious to everybody. So according to NPR itself, NPR has formally punished Uri Berliner, the senior editor who publicly argued a week ago that the network had, quote, lost America's trust by approaching news stories with a rigidly progressive mindset. Berliner's five-day suspension without pay, which began last Friday, has not been previously reported. The reason that they're mad, of course, is because this particular NPR employee said the obvious truth about NPR, that they are not to be trusted because they are far to the left and their agenda is apparent in everything they do. And by the way, it's still publicly funded. Well, if you actually wish to earn back the trust of Americans, what you wouldn't do is suspend Berliner. What you would do is maybe not have hired Catherine Marr, who is the new chief executive. NPR is treating her as a victim. They say conservative activist Christopher Rufo, who, by the way, don't get on Christopher Rufo's bad side, I think, is the, is the moral of this story. Is among those now targeting NPR's new chief executive. Ah, she's targeted. Ah, what a, what a brutal life it is to be an NPR executive who is having her tweets reviewed. Among others, those posts include a 2020 tweet that called Donald Trump a racist and another that appeared to minimize rioting during social justice protests that year. Meyer took the job in NPR last month, her first, at a news organization at all. In a statement... She said, quote, in America, everyone is entitled to free speech as a private citizen. What matters is NPR's work and my commitment as its CEO, public service, editorial independence, and the mission to serve all of America's public. NPR is independent, beholden to no party and without commercial interests. Uh-huh. Sure. So I just want to point out exactly what Catherine Marr has said in the past. Again, if you wish to earn back the trust of Americans, what you don't do is hire somebody like Catherine Marr. But the truth is that when you read Catherine Marr's tweets, there's really only one appropriate way to do it. And that's to apparently get really high and read it like beat poetry. So we're going to skip the part where we get really high, but we are going to read it like beat poetry because her tweets read like like beat poetry. She sounds like a Berkeley sophomore who has discovered pot for the first time and just read a little bit of Noam Chomsky. That that is what she sounds like. So here here we go. Let's get let's get the, the sound in here and let's do some deep thoughts from Catherine Marr, the brand new CEO of NPR, one of the biggest news outlets in America funded with your taxpayer dollars. My brothers and I had some deep talks. We're each over 30 with real jobs and deep discomfort about what it would mean to bring a child into a warming world. That's from March 26, 2019. Here's from 2011. With Elizabeth Warren running, there's finally a candidate for Dems to get excited about in 2012. Here's one from 2012. Agenda for today, put on a dress, meet some senior officials, boss it in a man's world. Critique the politics of representation. Scotch. 2019, always trust structural privilege to show itself. She's like a Kamala Harris fortune cookie over here. This is one of my favorites. This is from 2019. Quote, anyone else love watching the credits at the end of a movie or show just to marvel at the diversity of names and surnames involved? Always gives me happy goosebumps to see the world scroll by. Okay, literally no one. No one has ever watched the credits on Marvel movie and been like, wow, look at the racial diversity in those names. Here's from 2016. This is when she's a racial justice hero. Quote, for the record, I don't usually fly business class. Just bored past it on the way to the back of the bus. She's like Rosa Parks gang on the way to the back of the bus in commercial class. And finally, 2017. I'm in Canada today where the sun is shining. Healthcare is functional. Facts are real. And no one is about to be imminently annihilated. 
That was 2017. I noticed the calendar now says 2024, and no one was actually annihilated. I lied. There's one more that I have to that I have to include here. This is from 2018, and it's a handwritten note from her, kind of like Taylor Swift's latest lyrics. Quote: What would a feminist internet look like? What would a black internet look like? Wow. Wow. I haven't hadn't thought about that. By the way, she says, it's so strange to be called the Biden supporter. I'm a supporter of human rights, dignity, and justice. She's just one of the good people. Yes, probably that's it. Probably that person should be the head of NPR to restore their reputation for objective credibility. That's, I think, the the key message here. Suspend the guy who points out that they're a far-left organization. Make sure to protect the lady who tweets like that. Again, like a Berkeley sophomore who just discovered the pot stash. Well done. Okay, meanwhile, when Joe Biden continues to walk around confused, the Roomba of the president, as Shane Gillis has said, uh, that, that just doesn't stop. The world is falling apart, and so is Joe Biden. Here he was yesterday getting confused in Pennsylvania. Oh, there he is, President Joe Biden. Man, here he comes down the stairs. I swear, every time that dude goes downstairs, you're like holding your breath. Is he going to make it? Is he going to make it? He's, he's on, they, they, they let him take the short stairs now because he's, he's confused. Where am I going? I don't know. Dude, you have to finish going down the stairs first. That's where you're going. There's literally no directions. You're in the middle of the staircase. And he's like, where do I? Down, Joe. Down the staircase. That wasn't the only episode of Joe Biden becoming randomly confused yesterday. Here he was getting even more confused. You know, uh, thanks to the mayor, Paige, can, can, excuse me, I'm gonna, I was going to talk about the old mayor. Wow. Good stuff right there. It's always a good time for your presidential campaign when your attorney general has to declare that you are not mentally impaired. Joe Biden's 2024 campaign slogan, Biden 2024, not mentally impaired like you think. (laughs) Here is Merrick Garland. Thanks to Mitch McConnell for not allowing this schmuck to be on the Supreme Court of the United States. Have you ever seen evidence of impairment in your meetings with the president? I'm sorry, um, I, I, I testified and I'll repeat again what I just said. Well, that's different seen, than my question. Well, I have seen the president effectively guide the uh, members of the department of, of his cabinet uh, uh, and as military. Through but ins- you won't say you've ever seen uh, any impairment on his part? Uh, the, the, the president has no impairment. The president- You've is, never seen any? I don't know how many ways I can say this. Okay. I have complete confidence in the president and I reject your characterization. Well, I'm sorry that the rest of us have eyeballs and ears. Joe Biden is impaired, obviously. But it's not just that. Joe Biden is about to lead off a full decade of tepid growth, according to Axios. The era of rip-roaring global growth with rapidly rising prices to match is over. Now the global economy is transitioning to a steady but slow state, according to the IMF. The IMF projects the global economy will grow by 3.2% in this year and next, a similar pace to 2023. The fund suggested that the United States will grow 2.7% this year in terms of GDP. But over the course of the next decade, things are going too slow. Apparently, according to IMF Managing Director, Kristalina Georgieva, she says, quote, without a course correction, this decade will be remembered as the tepid 20s. So yeah, that, that sounds very, very good. Meanwhile, the Federal Reserve Not clear that they're going to be able to cut rates before the election because of the still trucking inflation created by Joe Biden's economic plans. So you have American economic policy in the doldrums and the world is on fire. Get to more on this in just one second. First, are you tired of your favorite cut of beef or chicken costing more but weighing less every single time you buy it from the store? Well, Good Ranchers Price Lock Guarantee offers a sizzling solution. During their April Price Shield campaign, Good Ranchers is not just offering a temporary fix. They're offering a long-term solution. They're locking in your price until 2026 when you subscribe to one of their boxes. GoodRanchers.com is where you can get the most tender meat that's full of flavor every single time. With options like beef, chicken, pork, and wild-caught seafood, they have something for even the pickiest of eaters. There's no reason to order takeout when you can make something far better at home. Good Ranchers even offers recipes to take your cooking skills to the next level. With meat prices on the rise and store-bought meat quality on the decline, Good Ranchers Price Shield will not only save you hundreds, but will give you the best 100% American meat you'll ever eat. Right now, when you go to GoodRanchers.com and use promo code Shapiro, you'll get their exclusive price shield and an additional 10% off your order. The offer ends soon. If you want to secure your best price on meat until 2026, go to GoodRanchers.com, use code Shapiro. Again, that's GoodRanchers.com with promo code Shapiro today. Former UK Prime Minister Liz Truss correctly pointed out yesterday that the world was much safer under Donald Trump. That, of course, is obviously true to anyone with a functional brain. Well, if you look at what's happened in 
Ukraine, what's taking place in Israel, what's happening with respect to the Chinese regime. The only thing these authoritarian regimes respect is strengths. And the fact is the West has shown too much weakness. Taking the sanctions off Iran, trying to renegotiate a nuclear deal, I believe that was the wrong strategy. And actually, the free world felt safer when President Trump was in office because those leaders were afraid of what Trump might do. They're not afraid of what Biden might that do. That is obviously what true. What we're seeing is we're seeing yep. wars breaking out around the world. She, of course, is exactly right about all of that. Meanwhile, with regard to Israel, it was the daylight created between the Biden administration and Israel that allowed for the Iranian attack in the first place. In fact, as we've talked about on the show, there may have been actual back channels between Iran and the United States, basically saying to the United States, we need to we need to flex our muscle a little bit. How far can we go before you'll allow Israel to actually get off the chain? And so they ended up firing 350 drones, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles at Israel. It did minimal damage to Israel, but that is, in fact, definitionally an act of war. Meanwhile, all Israel wants to do is finish off Hamas in the Gaza Strip, make a peace deal with the Saudis, and then deal with the Shia threat from Hezbollah in the north and from Iran directly. The Israeli military is saying that Iran will not get off scot-free following the unprecedented missile and drone attack early Sunday. Of course, Israel has to say that because if you just absorb a barrage of missiles and drones from a foreign nation and do nothing in response, that encourages them to take further action in the future, but more successfully, presumably. With that said, again, Benjamin Netanyahu, the war cabinet in Israel, is going to be pretty meticulous in how they go about this. They are not going to suddenly launch a, a nuclear weapon against Tehran or something. But Joe Biden continues to treat Israel as though Israel is the sort of radical pariah state. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin held calls on Monday with counterparts in the Middle East and Europe, expressing support for Israel after the attacks from Iran, but also stressing regional stability to prevent conflict from spreading. Well, I mean, you know, it's a great way to achieve regional stability, boxing in Iran. You know, it's a terrible way to achieve regional stability, kowtowing to Iran, catering to Iran, drawing contrast between you and allies, not just Israel, Saudi Arabia as well. Making yourself subject to the whims of crybaby idiots like anti-Israel Google employees who are occupying their boss's offices, according to the Daily Wire. Cassia Akiva reporting, Google employees are actively occupying the California office of Google Cloud CEO Thomas Kurian and refusing to leave until the company stops doing business with Israel. In a Twitch live stream, Google employees can be seen donning kafias and sitting on the floor in his office. On the 10th floor in the New York City Google office, where a simultaneous anti-Israel rally took place, employees carried anti-Israel signs and shouted chants asking Kurian, how many kids did you kill today? They also issued a series of demands, including that Google, quote, cease all business with the Israeli apartheid government and military, stop the harassment, intimidation, bullying, and silencing of Palestinian Muslim employees, and address the health and safety crisis among workers who are rattled over their labor being used to enable a genocide. Well, you could just be fired. That could be the other option. Any company that allows its employee base to act like this is not worth its salt. I promise you, if our employees decided to occupy my office, in order to make a political point, they would not be employees of this company very long. Security would escort them to the door box in hand. This is not like a lot of people want to work at Google. Ain't that hard to replace a bunch of pro-terror employees at Google. But unfortunately, it seems as though the Biden administration th seem, thinks that, that those sorts of people are hard to replace in the base. And so they're taking a, a sort of peculiar between Israel and Iran position as opposed to, you know, siding with American allies and defying actual terror states. Meanwhile, the situation in Ukraine continues to go from bad to worse, largely because of Western slow walking of aid. According to Politico, just ask a Ukrainian soldier if he still believes the West will stand by Kiev for as long as it takes. That pledge rings hollow when it's been four weeks since your artillery unit last had a shell to fire as one serviceman complained from the front lines. It's not just that Ukraine's forces are running out of ammo. Western delays over sending aid mean the country is dangerously short of something even harder to supply than shells. The fighting spirit required to win. Morale among troops is grim, ground down by relentless bombardment, a lack of advanced weapons, and losses on the battlefield. In cities hundreds of miles away from the front, crowds of young men who lined up to join the army in the war's early months have disappeared. Nowadays, eligible would-be recruits dodge the draft and spend their afternoons in nightclubs instead. Many have left the country altogether. The question in Ukraine is not going to be whether Ukraine is capable of taking back Donbass and Crimea, which I was always skeptical of. At this point, the question is whether Ukraine collapses altogether and Russia just strolls into Kyiv, having outlasted Western willingness to, you know, send checks. And there are no American troops participating on the ground in fighting against Russia. 
Here is Representative Mike Lawler, Republican of New York, saying, you know, it's actually a problem if Ukraine. Like, I still have yet to hear a Republican who fully wants to cut off aid from Ukraine explain why it would be in America's interest for Ukraine to fall to Russia. If you believe that American aid is unnecessary to prevent that eventuality, then please explain your plan for how the ammo is going to get to Ukraine to prevent that from happening. And then we can have the argument. If you're simply going to avoid the question, however, I think you're avoiding the question. This is why the kind of weird attempt to cut off aid in the face of Ukrainian resistance against an invading force that is overtly oriented against American interests across the world from the Middle East to Africa to its alliance with China to, yes, Eastern Europe. It's bizarre. Here's Representative Mike Lawler correctly pointing out that, you know, Russia's pretty ambitious territorially. And as I've said repeatedly, you know, my wife is from Moldova. Her family lives on the Ukraine border. Uh, I have no doubt if Ukraine falls, uh, these former Soviet satellite states will fall with it. And that is a calamity that none of us can afford uh, in the United States or in Europe. And so, you know, we must lead. And if we fail to lead in this moment, uh, we will be viewed like Neville Chamberlain uh, was in the lead up to World War II. Okay, so here is the reality. The Republican caucus, a majority of the Republican caucus in the House supports some serious level of Ukraine aid. An overwhelming majority of the House Republicans also support Israeli aid to Israel in the face of an Iranian offensive barrage, as well as barrages from Iran's proxies in the region, Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis. So it used to be that there was something in the Republican caucus that was called the Hastert Rule. The Hastert Rule was you can't bring forward a piece of legislation if you're a Republican that doesn't have a support of the majority of the Republican caucus. Both of these matters have a support of a majority of the Republican caucus. But because of a deal that Kevin McCarthy cut so that he could become Speaker of the House, this means that now every time a few members of the Republican caucus don't like what the rest of the Republican caucus is doing, they can threaten the speakership and basically hold up the entire business of the House. This is why I've been encouraging Speaker Mike Johnson to simply nuke this idiotic rule. It is a stupid rule that one or two members of the Republican caucus can hold up, you know, the other 210 members of the Republican caucus. It is stupid. It is wrong. It is foolish. McCarthy never should have signed that deal. And Johnson certainly certainly should not continue to acquiesce to that deal or he just won't be speaker. So how's he going to nuke that rule? Presumably, he'd get a majority of Republicans to vote in favor of nuking the rule and some Democrats. Because it turns out, you know what Hakeem Jeffries doesn't want? He thinks he's going to become speaker. You know what he doesn't want? He doesn't want AOC and Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib on his left threatening to nuke his speakership with a one vote rule every single time he does something they don't like. Now, there'll be a lot of caterwauling, a lot of screaming and yelling from Republicans. Oh my God, you got Democrat support to maintain your speakership. Okay, well, here is your... Here is your alternative. Your alternative in reality is going to be Hakeem Jeffries as speaker with a Republican House majority. That is the alternative. Not a single person who is currently challenging Johnson's speakership has a viable alternative to Johnson. We tried this game before. They went through like four candidates before they even got to Mike Johnson. And yet there's a group of people in Congress who are very much focused on on increasing their visibility in the public eye, making themselves appear to be significantly more important than the other members of an elected body. And let me be clear about this. Thomas Massey, Marjorie Taylor Greene, they are not more important in the Republican caucus than Mike Lawler in New York or anyone else. Every one of those votes is one vote. And the idea that you can have a couple of people holding hostage the entire House Republican caucus such that they cannot get anything done and will end up tossing the speakership to Akeem Jeffries makes me think that what you actually want is to be in the minority. It turns out, you know what Americans don't like very much? They don't like Congresses that are so incompetent they can't even name a speaker of their own party. It turns out Americans are not fond of that. But it seems like some Republicans actually like being in the minority because being in the minority means you never have to make a deal. Being in the minority means you can stand athwart the rails of history shouting stop without actually stopping a damned thing. It turns out that in order to stop things, you actually need to have power. But it seems like a lot of people don't want power. They want social media clout. They want X clout. Among those people, of course, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who has made herself incredibly famous. Based on no legislative accomplishments that I can see, here she was yesterday saying that she is going to challenge Speaker Johnson. Speaker next Congress, if we're lucky enough to have the majority. And I think that is is, is widely... Uh, the held belief throughout the conference. Is he going to be speaker for the rest of this Congress, do you think? That is to be determined. Okay, so she's saying that even if Johnson withstands the barrage right now, that in the next Congress, he won't be the speaker anymore. Okay, well, then you're going to have to find somebody who you like better. 
which you've been, the speaker ain't going to be Marjorie Taylor Greene. It's also not going to be Thomas Massey. So Massey, of course, is a true isolationist. He has, he's taking an isolationist position on pretty much everything up to and including things like funding for Iron Dome in Israel, which has prevented full-scale war in the Middle East, by the way. If Iron Dome did not exist, they would already be in a full-scale World War III style war in the Middle East. And okay, here is uh, Thomas Massey saying he now wants to join the motion to vacate because Johnson, faced with the prospect of a Democratic Senate and a de Democratic president, is pushing forward bills that Thomas Massey personally does not like. By the way, you know what actually Johnson's plan was up until today? His plan was that he was going to put forward as four separate votes, aid to Israel, aid to Ukraine, aid to Taiwan, and border funding. He's going to put all four of those up for separate votes. All four of them would then pass because some Democrats would vote for them, and then he would package them all together and send it over to the Senate. Massey doesn't like that. Massey wants all or nothing. He wants it exactly his way or nothing, which is not typically the way that Congress works. Here is Massey saying that he's going to join Marjorie Taylor Greene in this quixotic quest to oust the Speaker of the House in favor of. Congressman, can you, so you clarify to exactly? You yeah. to resign? What, what yes. exactly? Yeah, I asked him to resign. Well, when did you ask him? To he said he would not. You know, he said, well, you're the one who's going to put us into this because the motion is going to get called. OK, does anybody doubt that the motion will get called and then he's going to lose more votes than Kevin McCarthy. And I have told him this in private like weeks ago. So, I mean, when did you ask him to resign? Yeah, when did you ask right him in there. Resign? Just today. So, Congressman, help us understand that he's not resigning. Are then you going to push a motion to vacate this week? No, I'm not going to call the motion to vacate. But I will tell you that he's, if it is called, uh, there will be a lot of people who vote for it. Okay, so once again, Johnson needs to nuke this stupid rule. And if you don't like the Democrats are joining to nuke the stupid rule, Blame the Republicans who can't form anything remotely like a working House majority, despite having a House majority. It's such, honestly, it's, it's dumb. It's so stupid. It's so stupid on every available front. It's dumb politically. It's dumb in terms of policy. Here's Mike Johnson slamming the attempt to vacate his chair. I am not resigning, and it is, um, it is in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion when we are simply here trying to do our jobs. Um, it is not helpful to the cause. It is not helpful to the country. It has not helped the House Republicans advance our agenda, which is in the best interest of the American people here, a secure border, uh, sound governance. Uh, and it's not helpful to the unity that we have in, in the body. And right now we're in, a, we're in a, a political struggle, a battle between a completely different vision for the country. We, we have colleagues in the Congress who envision for us not those things. They have disdain for those things I just listed. They instead envision that America should be remade in the form of some sort of you know, European-style socialist utopia. That is a dangerous fool's errand. That is a road to Marxism, communism, you know, socialism. That's a step towards those eventualities, and that is not who we are as a country. And so for us to accomplish our mission, which is to save the republic, we need to add more Republicans to the House and grow the House majority so we have more votes. Yes, that would be the correct answer, as opposed to, you know, tearing apart the House conference in favor of me, which is not actually a policy prescription. Johnson should move to nuke the rule forthwith. In my opinion, he should have done it weeks ago at this point. All right, coming up. We'll get to a couple of free speech stories that are kind of fascinating. If you're not a member, become a member. Use code Shapiro. Check out for two months free on all annual plans. Click that link in the description and join us.